That concludes the opening statements uh, from both sides. Uh, we will begin uh, with uh, a uh, presentation of evidence from the Commonwealth. Uh, who do you wish to call as your first witness, Mr. Robinson? Trooper Miller, Judge. Okay. Uh, Trooper Miller, if, uh, if you could please come up to the uh, witness stand, and before you have a seat, if you could face me and raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear and from the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay. Please be seated. Witness, I'm out of your way, right? Please state your full name for the record. Miller. Are you presently employed? I am. What do you do, Mr. Miller? Trooper with Kentucky State Police. Before you took the, uh, well, when did you uh, first become employed by the State Police? Uh, it would be uh, April of 2012. Before you were hired by KSP in April of 2012, did you have any prior experience in law enforcement? Yes, sir. In uh, September of 2008, I was hired on with the Shelby County Sheriff's Office as a road deputy. And then prior to that, I was with Millersburg Police Department in Bourbon County for about a year and a half, hired in March of 2007. So is it fair to say that uh, your experience in law enforcement began in March of 2007? Yes, sir. So we're uh, between nine and ten years of experience. Um, I, I, mi I miss the age, the first agency that hired you. Millersburg. Millersburg. No relation to me. W where is Millersburg? It's in uh, Bourbon County. It's north of Paris. All right. Now, when um, you were hired by Millersburg, did you have to uh, – complete any formal training before you took a position there? Uh, with Millersburg, I was sworn in uh, prior to going to the academy. In November of 2007 is when I was sent to the academy. Okay. And when you say the academy, what are you talking about? Department of Criminal Justice Training in Richmond. An 18-week academy, and I graduated in April 2008. Okay. So you had 18 weeks of formal training. Um, I guess after, immediately after you were hired by the city of Millersburg? Yes, sir. All right. Did any portion of that 18 weeks uh, relate to um, the detection of individuals under the influence or driving under the influence? Yes, sir. There was a 40-hour uh, block um, dedicated to just field sobriety. So for, for one week, um, you did nothing but study field sobriety? Can you tell the jurors a little bit about that training? Was it all book work? Were there any, was there any clinical training? Just You don't have to belabor it, but just tell them a little bit about that. Week. The first part of it was um, explaining the three tests, the horizontal gaze nystagmus, the walk and turn, and the one leg stand. They explained it. They showed you what it is. The instructor showed you what it is. We saw videos of um, uh, instructors on video performing these tests the instructors perform the test and then the last part of the week we actually performed the tests um, the rich uh, department of criminal justice training actually has people come in that they put them in a contained group and they give them alcohol of various sorts male female tall what tall doesn't matter short and uh, they consume certain amounts of alcohol and then we perform they put certain people with us, with instructors, and we perform our practical tests on them. So is it fair to say that that uh, training that you completed back in November of 2007 um, partially related to um, field sobriety testing? Yes, sir. And your training as to field sobriety testing was uh, part clinical and part just study. Did you have some um, written materials that you studied also? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, did did you, were you tested after you underwent that training? Yes, sir. All right. How, how were you tested? Was that just a, a written test? 
there was a written test, and then there was also a practical that you had to pass, several practicals. Now, did you successfully complete both the written test and the practical exam? Yes, sir. And then you were hired in September of 2008 by the Shelby County Sheriff's Office. Correct. And um, who was the sheriff at that time? Sheriff Mike Armstrong. And did you undergo any further training after being transitioning over to the Shelby County Sheriff's Office? Uh, besides keeping, uh, in order to keep your, uh, your peace officer professional standards, which is abbreviated as POPs, um, every year we have to have a 40-hour in-service class. So I've completed 40-hour in-service classes, and all not related to sobriety testing, related to everything from, you know, sexual assault, robbery, just there's okay. each class has its own title. You weren't sent back to the DOCJT by the Shelby County Sheriff's Office, were you? For, the, for those particular classes, I was, yes. Okay, I got you. But not for like the 18-week no, course. No, 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 that was a basic training. Right. Um, were you certified back in November of 2007 on the intoxilizer? Yes. Now, you mentioned that 40 hours of your training was dedicated to the field sobriety tests. Was there testing uh, associated with the intoxilizer? 40 hours. That, that, that was another 40 hours, or that was part of the same 40 An additional hours? 40. Okay, so you studied the intoxilizer for an entire week. Yes. And was there any testing? Did, did you have to pass any tests to, to move on with your training? Yeah, we had to pass. During midweek, we had to pass a test on the functioning of it, how to use it. And then at the end of the week, we did a practical test. And has, were you certified to, to use that instrument? Have you maintained that certification continuously to today's date? I have. And then you were hired by the Kentucky State Police in April of two. Well, let me back up just a bit. Um, did you, what were your duties with the Shelby County Sheriff's Office from September of 08 to April of 12? I was a road deputy, so I was, uh, I worked primarily second shift, which is uh, three to 11 here. Uh, take calls, calls for service anything that somebody would call into dispatch needing help with um, from our motorist assist to you know a domestic violence call so primarily you worked between the hours of 3 and 11 yes, sir. Um, while you were with the sheriff's office did you um, have any DUI or investigations and arrests yes, sir. do you feel comfortable estimating how many uh, DUI arrests you may have made between uh, September of 08 when you were hired by the Sheriff's Office in April of 2012? Mm, I know hundreds. I couldn't give you exactly. Probably 200. Do you feel comfortable estimating what percentage of your uh, your traffic citations may result may have resulted in DUI arrests while you're with the Sheriff's Office? Less than 5 percent. So if I understand you correctly, 95% of the time you issued a traffic citation, that didn't result in a DUI arrest. Correct. Um, when you were hired by the Kentucky State Police, did they um, require you to undergo any uh, training kind of immediately after you were hired? Yes, sir. Uh, it was a uh, it was an accelerated program, so we didn't go through the full 22 weeks. It was a 12-week academy that they uh, um, it was more of a uh, refresher, if you will, um, on how state police operates other differently than Department of Criminal Justice training. Um, so a 12 week. Did any portion of that 12 weeks uh, relate to the detection and, and I guess the, uh, the handling of DUI investigations and arrests? We had a week that was dedicated to, um, we had yeah, a week that was dedicated to field sobriety testing. Okay. And in addition to that week of FST training with the KSP, was there any additional training uh, relating to the intoxilizer? There was not. Okay. But you nonetheless have maintained your certification on the intoxilizer. Yes. Briefly describe your duties as a trooper. Well, actually, what's your title now? A senior trooper. And did you have that title back in March of, of 2015? No, sir. I was trooper. Okay. What were your duties back in March of 20? Generally, what were your duties as a trooper back in March of 2015? Uh, that night I was assigned uh, five counties to cover. Um, 
it uh, just as any of the other counties calls for service anything that would come in um, I've got uh, you know I have a county radio on in case anything comes in through Shelby County or Spencer County or any other counties so same as the sheriff's office it's a larger jurisdiction let me back up just a bit um, to ask a couple of more questions about your field the, the field sobriety training that you received um, both through DOCJT and the State Police Academy did you um, receive any certifications uh, relating to field sobriety testing and you, you mentioned that there was there were tests that you had to pass my next question is was there some type of certification you received issued by DOCJT or the state police for field sobriety testing Department of Criminal Justice training uh, we got a certification for the uh, intoxilizer 5000 um, and then as far as the field sobriety we didn't get a certification we just took a test and okay and as long as you pass the test you're you're good all right to, to your knowledge does DOCJT or the State Police Academy issue a separate certification for field sobriety um, testing I got a certification through Kentucky State Police for a class called a ride that's a 16-hour class that was in that that block and that stands for advanced roadside impairment recognition enforcement so it's looking at someone who's not just an alcohol user but also a drug user someone who's a poly drug user um, you know if you're under the influence of alcohol and a narcotic what the signs of the body are exhibit all right so there is some type of certification for completing that a ride yes sir all right did you study the standard field sobriety tests as part of that a ride training Prior to that A-Ride training, they wanted to, the academy staff wanted to make sure everybody was on the same page. Since this was a class that was prior law enforcement, and um, guys with three years up to 15 years were in this class, so they wanted to make sure that everybody was on the same page. And so we did do uh, the standard field sobriety testing and had to pass practicals with that. Okay. As part of the A-Ride, or was that a pre Prior to the A-Ride. Prior to the A-Ride. Okay. What factors um, were you trained by DOCJT and the Kentucky State Police Academy to look for um, when you suspect you're dealing with uh, an impaired driver or someone who has consumed alcoholic beverages? Um, contact with the person or prior to contact? let's just start with contact with the person what are you looking uh, for with contact with the person uh, the smell of an alcoholic beverage emitting from the breath their breath bloodshot watery eyes fumbling with a license or an insurance card um, uh, emotional like some people will get emotional heavy sweating um, dry mouth um, those are some of the main keys that we would focus in on are you uh, trained to look at the eyes yes and what do you look for uh, well initial contact you're looking at see if they're uh, watery bloodshot eyes um, you know heavy redness and are you trained to ask specific questions about drug or alcohol consumption uh, it's it's going to be a you know every stop I try to conduct in the same way to where if I'm doing do smell the odor of an alcoholic beverage then I'll start in conversation with that where are you coming from where are you going um, have we had anything to drink tonight who are you with um, look and see how the person's dressed see if they're coming from a club or coming from a, an outing a wedding um, try to size up exactly what you're dealing with is the time of day significant in to you yes how so well at night more of your bars and clubs are going to be open um, it uh, versus in the daytime obviously you can still drink and drive in the day but uh, in my experience working night shifts solely um, I've run into a lot of people coming from clubs and bars and uh, um, you know restaurants actually restaurants that sell alcoholic beverages Please explain to the jury what field sobriety tests are and uh, what purposes they serve. 
Field sobriety tests, at least the starting with the three, the the horizontal gaze nystagmus, the walk and turn, and the one leg stand, they're all divided attention tests. So you're you're giving somebody a task and you're trying to divide their attention during that task and someone who is normally who is not impaired or under the influence can perform that test versus somebody who is under the influence will have difficulty performing that test. Not saying they can't complete the test, but they're going to have difficulty completing the tests. And throughout that test, they're going to show what we call a clue, clues that what we mark with me, I hash mark on my hand to know exactly what I'm looking at for further documentation. And um, why do you use these tests? Uh, well, those are the tests that I was trained, um, trained for. Um, they're uh, tests that were uh, um, adopted by, uh, by NHTSA. And, uh, and what is NHTSA? Uh, it's, uh, was it National Tra Transportation? I'm not certain what the actual abbreviation is. I think it's NHTSA, yes. uh, National Highway Traffic Safety yes. Administration. And um, are they, uh, do you issue pass-fails on these tests? Rephrase that. Do you, when, when you're administering the test, I mean, do you grade someone on the test? Do you issue a, a, a written score? Not a written score, but, I mean, if somebody, I mean, I try to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Um, uh, based upon the, tr the clues that I'm trained to look for, that's what I'm marking hash marks for to show how many clues are they showing in this test. For example, the horizontal gaze nystagmus, you've, you know, six clues you're looking for, three in each eye, um, or for the total HGN test. Um, so there's certain clues that you are just trained to look for. All right. Now, what is the is there a standard battery of field sobriety tests? There is. Okay. Um, and, and again, what are what is that standard battery? Uh, the first we abbreviate for HGN: horizontal gaze nystagmus. Second is walk and turn, and the third is the one leg stand. Okay. And we'll get into those uh, a little more um, extensively in a few minutes. I want to direct your attention now to your initial contact uh, with the defendant. Um, did you work on in the early morning hours of March 15th of 2015? Yes, sir. Were you in uniform and in a marked patrol car? Yes, sir. All right. Do you recall approximately where you were and what you were doing at around 1.20 a.m.? Uh, 1.20 a.m. I was on the right side, the right shoulder of I-64 at about the 29-mile marker. Uh, I was blacked out, had my lights off, and I was running stationary radar. Uh, that is an area, having worked this county for many years, uh, on Friday nights and Saturday nights, uh, eastbound traffic, I uh, would commonly run into people coming from Louisville, having been drinking, coming from clubs and bars. Um, that is my sole reason for sitting out there, is to get not only people speeding, but also try to prevent um, collisions and um, people from driving in the influence. Were you seated in your vehicle, or? And what type of, of radar instrumentation do you have in that vehicle? Uh, I've got a state issued. It's what's called a, a Stalker DSR 2X. It's one of the more advanced radar units on the market. Uh, it is a dual, what's called a dual band radar system. So I can run the front radar and the rear radar independently of each other, and it also has a fastest, slowest feature. For example. Prior to issuing somebody a traffic citation, you need to see, visibly tell that that vehicle is traveling faster than another vehicle. That's when you admit your radar and get a reading on the screen. Was this the first radar instrument that you'd used in your career? No. Um, uh, approximately how many other radar units did you have? Uh, one other radar unit. It was uh, made by MPH. It was with the Sheriff's Office. Okay. And... Um, how do these two units compare? I mean, do you feel, did you feel more confident with one or the other? I feel more confident with the Stalker unit because it is a KA band versus a K band. It sends the, the frequency a lot faster at over 350,000 feet per second, gets the speed and brings it back to your screen. Um, it's, uh, you know, I use tuning forks on it every, every, before every shift. Those are certified tuning forks and it's got internal calibration. 
I mean, it's I'm very confident with it. Okay, and I'm guessing one of the advantages to the dual radar is that you don't have to get out of your vehicle to turn the other way to like shoot the radar. Yeah. So I mean, if you're, for example, if you're on I-64 and you have east and westbound traffic, I can sit on the right shoulder and run rear rear same direction traffic coming in behind me, and then opposite the opposite direction coming at me with the front, so front opposite direction at the same time because it has split screen. Do you remember what traffic was like that evening? There wasn't any. What's that? The very, very light, very light. Hardly any cars on the road. Right. Uh, did you hear or observe anything at about 1.20 a.m. that led you to believe that a traffic offense was committed? Mm. Uh, I observed a lone vehicle in the interstate, left lane, far left lane. It's a three-lane interstate, so it's anyone that's familiar with Shelby County, uh, west of city limits uh, interstate. It's three lanes. It's wide. It's got wide. It's got a wide median and a wide right shoulder. Um, so I'm sitting on the right shoulder. I observed a vehicle um, traveling a visible, high, visibly high rate of speed. Uh, transmitted radar and it brought the signal back to my radar screen of 85 miles an hour. It was the lone vehicle in the road. There was no other vehicle in sight. All right. Now the vehicle that you're talking about, did you ultimately stop that vehicle? Yes, sir. Did you ultimately learn what type of vehicle that was? Yes, sir. And what type of vehicle was it? Uh, it was a newer vehicle. Uh, it was a 2013 Bay Chevy Tahoe. How do you know, well, before how do you know that the the radar instrumentation gave you an accurate reading? What assurances can can you provide the jurors that that reading was accurate? Uh, well, I mean, it's besides using my tuning forks, which are certified prior to shift. Um, after I use the tuning forks, the radar has its own internal self check. It doesn't calibrate itself. It's got its own self check, um, and commonly. Uh, while running radar, moving radar, I'll look at my speedometer, which is also a certified speedometer. I'll look and see if my vehicle and also, say, my GPS are all reading the same speed. And it's, and it's always the same. It's never changed variances. Since this particular instrument was issued to you, have uh, you experienced any problems with it that required any maintenance? No, sir. To your knowledge, uh, to the best of your knowledge, was it functioning properly? Uh, around 1.20 a.m. on March 15th of 2015. What were, the, uh, what were the weather, lighting, and road conditions that morning, if you remember? Uh, the weather was, uh, I couldn't tell you what the weather, I know it wasn't raining. It was comfortable outside. Um, no lighting in that portion of the interstate. Okay. Any precipitation? Any uh, snow on the ground? All right. What was the posted speed limit? 70. And what was the, the radar reading? 85. And did you um, obtain a, a visual estimation of speed as well, or did you just rely solely on the radar? I always, I always obtain a visual estimation. Um, and having run radar for many years, um, it's very easy for me to distinguish vehicle speed. I'm not saying right on, but in the practical test, we have to be within five miles an hour visibly to looking at a vehicle. And I can tell a vehicle was traveling at a high rate of speed. Isn't that hard when there's no other traffic around, though? Doesn't that complicate it? No. I mean, you, I mean, it, it's kind of hard sitting here to, to explain unless you go out and actually I show you. How many times have you done it? Yeah. How, how many times have you visually estimated the speed of a vehicle in your life? I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. Thousands? I mean, um, easily, easily, yes, sir. You said that the vehicle was uh, in the, the far left of three lanes. Yes, sir. Did it remain in that far left lane as it passed um, the location of your vehicle? Yes, sir. Okay. Now I want you to just uh, tell the jurors what you observed and, and what you did after that point? I uh, conducted a traffic stop in the vehicle. Uh, being that the vehicle was in the left lane, when my lights came on, that's when the vehicle went into what we would 
what we refer to as the median or the left portion of the roadway. This portion of the roadway is a newer section of the interstate and it has a large median wall to prevent median crossover. Um, made contact with the operator, it's the sole person in the vehicle, there's nobody else in the vehicle. Um, where, where did the vehicles come to a stop? Where were they located in relation to the lanes of travel? Uh, on the far left side. And it's, you've got three lanes, a right shoulder, and then what would be considered the median of the road. Was there room in the median? You, you mentioned that there was some type of barricade there or wall. Yeah, the median, the medians, the way they've set the, the way Department of Transportation set this section of the interstate up is both medians are designed for a semi truck to be able to safely park there. So um, there was plenty of room for a Tahoe and a Dodge Charger there to fit in there safely. So my understanding is the vehicles stopped um, to the left of the far left lane. Is that accurate? Correct. Okay. Because most of the traffic stops that I've personally uh, witnessed have been over in the right shoulder. Most people would, would merge to the far right shoulder, but this instance she stopped in the median there. Okay. Um, so you didn't direct her to pull off to that side of the highway? No, sir. Did you initiate your emergency lights before she stopped? Yes, sir. All right. And I, did, I interrupted. Keep keep going. Sorry. Uh, made uh, made contact with uh, the sole operator of the vehicle, um, the female operator, uh, and talking to her, see where she was coming from, where she was going. I could smell the odor of an alcoholic beverage emitting from from the vehicle. Until uh, she had uh, bloodshot bloodshot watery eyes. Um, said she was coming from Bardstown Road, which I know that's, uh, having worked this area, I know that's a common area at night where there's bars, and said she was drinking at Bardstown Road. Did you all have um, any conversation while she was still seated in the vehicle, or was all of the conversation, t tell me how much conversation took place while she was still seated in the vehicle, if you remember. That was the conversation that was seated. Um, I asked her where she was coming from. She said Bardstown Road. I asked her what she was doing there. Um, um, she was out drinking. Um, I can't recall if she said she was with friends or not. Um, and uh, she got her, her license, took her license. I, as habit, for safety reasons and having my hands free in case anything happens, I stole someone's license in my belt and I asked her to step out of the vehicle based upon my observations of the bloodshot water eyes and the odor of an alcoholic beverage and her admission to having drank earlier in the night. Did she, did she say what she had ha consumed? I don't recall. Fair enough. Is that generally questions that you would ask? It is. It is. Um, you know, because everything has its own alcohol percentage and um, that does that does play a factor. Okay. You just don't remember I don't, what this, her this response case I did not know. Fair enough. Do you recollect if she told you how many alcoholic beverages she had consumed? Not not off the top of my head, sorry, did not. Approximately how close were you um, to the side of the Tahoe when I'm assuming she rolled the window down and did not and did not open the door initially? Right. Okay. Approximately how close were you to the Tahoe when you first sensed the smell of an alcoholic beverage? Uh, I was right at the driver's side door frame when I could smell. When she put her window down, I could smell an odor coming out of alcoholic beverage. So when I initially made contact with her and started asking her where she was coming from, where she was going to, um, it's habit for me in all of my stops uh, that if I'm smelling that, if I suspect somebody has been drinking, uh, I'll ask them for registration and their insurance and their license, um, which I do in all stops. But when I do that, they're going to look away and grab something. So they're getting the document that I'm asking for. While they do that, 
I'll stick my head in your car and take a huge sniff to see if it's, exact, it's exactly what I'm smelling, if it's outside or if it's coming from your vehicle coming from you. And that's exactly what I did in this instance. So, you know, I tried to stick my head in the car as best I could and smell, and it confirmed that I'm smelling alcoholic beverage coming from the vehicle. And she hadn't denied drinking alcoholic no. beverages? No. When you encountered, oh, okay, uh, approximately how long did you talk to her while she was still seated in the car or the truck? Less than a minute. And then what happened? I asked her to step out of the vehicle. Step, we stepped out of the vehicle, went to the rear of the vehicle, uh, shut her car door, and uh, that's when I, uh, we proceeded with uh, field sobriety testing. Did she appear to be physically injured in any way to you? Did she inform you that she was suffering from any type of uh, injury at this time? No. Did she inform you at any point that she was on any sort of medication or that she was under a doctor's care for any reason? No. Now I want to focus on the field sobriety tests. Um, why did you feel the need to administer field sobriety tests? Because that's a tool that I was trained to use. The standard field sobriety test is you know, through two academies. Uh, it's it's what I know. It's what I've been trained. It's what I've used for years. And based on training experience, it works. Now, um, are field sobriety tests in themselves what you use to make a decision whether someone's impaired? Everything comes together as a package. So from your initial observations of the vehicle to your observations and conversations with somebody, um, how are they acting? Um, are they fumbling with their license? They have slurred speech, bloodshot, watery eyes, uh, to getting them out of the vehicle if they're using the vehicle for support, having trouble walking. Um, and then, that, so it all, to answer your question, everything is together as a package. After the field sobriety, then you make a decision on whether to rest or not. Okay. About how many times have you administered field sobriety tests in the field? Hundreds. Do you ever um, administer field sobriety tests and let people drive home? Yes. Do you feel comfortable um, estimating what percentage of the time you administer field sobriety tests and allow people mm, to over go half, home? Half the time I'm, that I suspect um, that someone has been drinking, I'll get them out. And they had been drinking. They admit they'd been drinking. But based on field sobriety tests, training experience, I don't believe you're over an 08. Um, and I believe you can safely operate a motor vehicle. Which test did you ask the defendant to perform? I asked her to perform the, uh, uh, the three standard tests I was trained on, which is the HGN, the one leg stand, and the walk and turn. Do you administer them in the same order each time? Uh, yeah, HGN, walk and turn, one length stands, the way that I, the way I was trained to administer them and the way I administer them. I want to ask you some specific questions now about the, the HGN uh, test. Uh, again, what part of the body are you observing when you give this test? The eyes. And again, what is HGN? It's horizontal gaze nystagmus. Uh, it's one of many kinds of nystagmus, but we are trained to typically look at the eyes horizontally. So the eyes left and right is what you're looking at. And I hold my finger up, you can use a pen, whatever, but that's, that's something for them to look at. It's a stimulus for them to look at, and you hold it 12 to, 12 to 15 inches from their face, from their nose, and above a little bit of their nose so they can see it. And prior to actually performing the test, you want, them, you want to make sure that they can actually do the test. Um, I ask them if they have eyeglasses, ask them to remove their eyeglasses. Um, if they, uh, I'll ask them, do you have any medical issues with your eyes, glaucoma, anything that would prevent you from looking at me and following my finger? And I get a response from them in that. With, in this instance, there was not. Uh, and then I'll look at your eyes to see if you have some what's called resting nystagmus. 
in arresting nystagmus is basically what nystagmus is the uncontrolled twitching of the eye. So we're looking at the eye to see if they have resting nystagmus. If your eyes are just bouncing, looking at me. Is that common? No. Do you know in what percentage of people may have resting nystagmus? Your Honor, I don't believe this witness is qualified to answer that question. Um, did it, if it was addressed in his training, I, I, that, that should have been my first question. I'm sorry, may I ask? If you want to reorganize yes, your sir. questions, we can do it. Um, what, during your training, was there any discussion as to what portion of, of the pop, general population may have arresting nystagmus? Very little. Very little training or? Very little, very few amount of people have arresting nystagmus. Um, is there a, I think you've already addressed this, but is there a standard way in which HGN should be administered and is, and administer, is administered by you? Yes, sir. And did you administer the HGN to Ms. Wood in accordance with your uh, standard operating procedure? Yes, sir. And the way you had been trained? Yes, sir. All right. Did you ask her before you administered if she understood what you, were, you wanted her to do? Yes, sir. Did she indicate she understood? Yes, sir. Did the defendant have any difficulty following directions? No. Now, I would like to ask you about the clues you're taught to look for. What is the first clue of the HGN test? First part of the test is what's called lack of smooth pursuit. So in, in, in doing that, I'm moving my finger to the left and right of your face. And, and it's as you're moving your finger, you're just, it's a gradual pace as you're moving your finger. And what you, well, basically what you're looking for is you're watching the eyes to see if they can track your finger. Are they tracking your finger smoothly? or are they tracking your finger where they're bouncing? They're trying, their eyes are trying to catch your finger and you can see the eyes physically bouncing as you're going back and forth. So that's what we're looking for in lack of smooth pursuit. When um, you administered this part of the test or observed this part of the test um, with Ms. Wood, what did you observe? Observed both her eyes um, were having were having problems. They she did show lack of smooth pursuit in both eyes, going left and right. All right. What is the second clue that you're looking for on the HGN? Um, distinct nystag distinct and sustained nystagmus. So basically, I'm holding my finger. It's the same thing, but now I'm holding my finger all the way out to where you can see just a little bit of the white of the eye. So your your eyes are flexed all the way over as far as you can see. And what you're looking for while the eyes rest there and you hold it four to six seconds back and forth. But you're looking for the eyes, the nystagmus in the eyes, to start bouncing. And that's different from lack of smooth pursuit. Correct. The because lack of smooth pursuit is um, what you're looking for before the eye gets to the maximum flex point. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. And when you gave that, when you observed that particular part of the test uh, with Miss Wood, what did you observe? She showed uh, both eyes. She showed nystagmus in both eyes at maximum deviation. And what is the final part of the test? The uh, final part of the test is onset prior to 45 degrees. And it's holding my finger in the center of your face from the start position. As you move either to the left or right, and you're slowly moving the finger, and you're watching their eyes till the eyes start to, start to twitch. When the eye starts to twitch, you hold that position four to six seconds and watch to see the nystagmus in the eyes and if they show nystagmus in the eyes prior to. And what did you observe during this portion of uh, the administration on Ms. Wood? Uh, with her, I went almost all the way out to maximum uh, prior to maximum deviation. I didn't see any nystagmus. Okay. And what did your observation, um, your observations uh, of the defendant's performance on this test indicate to you? Uh, based on based on just this portion uh, is that um, she was under the influence of alcohol or she is under the influence of alcohol. In your experience, is there a connection between HGN and the amount of alcohol a person has consumed? There is. Uh, somebody who has consumed higher amounts of alcohol, uh, you will see signs of nystagmus sooner. Um, 
the sustained nystagmus and the lack of smooth pursuit, and, and depending on how much they've consumed, some people may have resting nystagmus. Uh, so there is a direct correlation to alcohol consumption in okay. HDN. Are the clues or your observations during the administration of this test um, indicative of the presence of alcohol in Ms. Wood's body? Rephrase that. Yeah, are the, your observations during the administration of this particular test, are those observations indicative of the presence of alcohol in Ms. Wood's body? And did you quantify the clues that you observed on this particular test? Yes, sir. All right, and what was the, I guess, the, the number of clues you observed? Four. Four clues. You've got a total of six, uh, and I observed four of the six. Now, what was the next uh, field sobriety test you administered? The walk and turn. And uh, tell the jurors a little bit about that. Walk and turn is a divided attention test, so it's it's a test prior to the test. I ask, I'll ask you if you have any problems with your hips, knees, joints, any medical issues, surgeries that would prevent you from taking a walking test or prevent you from walking, period. And based on a response, I mean, if someone's had, had an injury, then, you know, I will note that. Um, but in this particular case, we didn't have any injuries and she didn't indicate that. Would you mind demonstrating um, the, the test for the jurors? Yeah. And um, do you have a kind of a standard routine or habit that you follow on the roadside? I do. Uh, if a line is available, I like to use a line. And most of the time, if I, in a safe manner, if I suspect that I will be doing field sobriety, I will move my car. I'll have them stay where they are. I'll move my car and block a lane so that way I can safely do field sobriety on the roadside. Uh, this instance we're on I-64 and nothing is safe on I-64, so that's why I didn't do it in this particular instance. Uh, but if we have a line, I like to use a line. And, and I, want you, I don't want you to, to truncate it or shorten it just because we're in court here today. I want you to just, if you have a standard routine, just uh, demonstrate that for the jurors. So what, I'm, what I tell you to do while you're facing me, I tell you to put your left foot on the line, put your right foot in front of that foot. I instruct you to stay like that, don't move until I'm done with my instructions, you understand, okay, yes or no. If they don't understand, I'll repeat myself as many times as it takes for them to understand. With your right foot in front of your left, you're going to take nine heel-toe steps. You're going to turn around, you're going to take nine heel-toe steps back. So what you're going to do with your nine steps, you're going to take nine steps. One, two, three, on so to nine. When you get to your ninth step, you're going to look like this. Right foot in front of your left. Use your right foot, you do a series of small turns, and you're gonna do nine steps back. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm so did nine. Now, did you instruct Miss Wood this way as you have just demonstrated? I did. All right. You're welcome to return to the seat. Did the defendant indicate that she understood your instructions? She did. And and prior to instruction, I, I make sure that they keep their arms at their side, they look at their feet and they count their steps out loud and do not stop. Did she attempt this test? She did. All right. And please describe um, the defendant's actions and, and your observations as you observed them. Uh, she, uh, her first nine steps, she was heel to toe. I didn't see any clues. Um, her, as far as her turn, she, she turned improperly instead of turning like I instructed her to turn. She just turned around like anybody would just turn around. Uh, then on her return, I'm going to have to refresh my memory with citation uh, to, okay. to explain. Sir. Okay, so she stepped off line and counts five and eight of her return steps. So you have nine steps down, which I didn't see any clues. She turned them properly, which is going to be a clue. And then on her return steps back, um, on steps five and eight, um, she uh, stepped off the line, so which means she couldn't maintain her balance in walking. 
she's stepping off line for balance. So she's stopping, stepping off line, and then continuing. It, that's step five, six, seven, eight, steps off line for balance, continues to nine. Um, during, throughout the portion of the test, um, she also used her arms for balance, which in the initial instruction, I advise you to keep your arms at your side throughout the duration of the test. So she's using her arms more than six inches is going to be the clue off of your side. So she's using her arms for balance. Okay. Um, was there any significant significance um, in your mind to your observations um, during um, her walk and turn test? Was did, did it, was there any significance in your mind? Uh, what did, uh, What was the significance of the defendant's clues that you observed in your mind, if anything? I mean, I guess what did you gather from the administration of this particular test? Uh, that just, uh, it, same as with the HGN, this is just showing that she, at least on her return steps, she didn't follow the instruction of keeping her arms at her side. She had to step off line twice for balance and she turned improperly, not like the instructions. So she was having an issue with the turn. She had an issue with the return nine steps, and she had an issue with the instruction of keeping her arms at her side, which quantified that she's, based on training experience, those are clues we look for for um, people under the influence. Okay. Was that a significant number of clues in your mind? Uh, well, uh, we're trained to look for more than two. Um, there's eight clues that we look for in this. Uh, we're trained to look for, uh, at least in this, um, you're looking for a minimum of two. And what was the total number of clues that you observed? Uh, those eight? Based on what I'm seeing, what I'm seeing here, she had three clues. For she stepped off, she um, she turned improperly, which is one clue. She stepped off line in five and eight. That's one clue. And then she used her arms for balance. That's one clue. So she had three of the eight. And. Um, what was the, the last field sobriety test that you administered? Uh, one leg stand. All right. And again, would you mind demonstrating that to the jurors just as you would at the roadside? Well, before we do that, I don't want to assume that you have a, a standard um, kind of procedure that you follow on the roadside. But I'm going to ask that question. Do you have kind of a standard regimen that you follow for this test? Okay. Would you mind demonstrating that standard regimen? I'll ask you to put your feet together. Uh, put your feet together, arms to your side. Um, and you can face whatever, whatever direction that you want to face. And you can use whatever foot that you want to use. Your foot doesn't matter. But the instruction of the test is with your arms at your side, I need you to look at the foot that you decide. Take that foot, point your toe out, keep your foot about six inches off the ground. While looking at your foot, I need you to count out loud. Thousand one, thousand two, thousand three, thousand four, and so on to instruct you to stop. That's all you're doing. If you're looking at your foot, you're counting your arms at your side. Do you understand? And we'll get a yes or no. They say no, I'll explain as many times as it takes for them to understand. Once they start, once they bring, and as I'm giving instruction, I turn my stopwatch on and we're looking for 30 seconds. And based on training, we look for 30 seconds. So once that foot comes off the ground, I start my stopwatch. I'm watching them, but also watching my stopwatch to make sure that we don't go past 30 seconds. After 30 seconds, they're done. Thank you. And you can return to the chair. Can you please uh, tell the, the jurors what you observed um, when you administered? Well, did, did she um, take the, the one leg stand? She did. All right. And, and what did you observe? Uh, of the four clues, uh, which we looked for two, she showed one. She used her arms for balance. Fair enough. Um, at that point, did you do anything else? to make a judgment as to whether um, her condition warranted taking her into custody. No, sir. So what was your determination as to whether her condition warranted taking her into custody? Uh, based on my initial observations of her, uh, her admissions to drinking and then me, um, you know, doing the field sobriety test, which Go, coincides with what she said of her drinking. Uh, the reliability of uh, my training experience, that's why I placed her under arrest for DUI. Okay. What other options did you have? At that point in time? Yes, sir. Uh, she was going to Lexington from Louisville. Um, 
I didn't have any. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could you could take her home, but that's not. We don't we don't do that. I get in trouble for that. Did you feel um, that you could have allowed her to just get back in her Tahoe and drive home? No, not at all. And how long, what did you do? How did you take her into custody? What, how does that work? Uh, well, after the last test, you know, I advised her, you know, said based on training experience, I'm placing your arrest for DUI, and you turn around and put your hands behind your back. Um, once I said that and put handcuffs on her, um, she became very emotional um, and crying. Um, and it uh, placed her in my car, called on the radio that I had arrested one female, and I uh, need a record for her vehicle. And so we sat and waited for the record. Once the record showed up, took her vehicle, and her vehicle secured, uh, I transported her uh, by policy. Since she's a female, I have to call out my miles. So I called out my mileage beginning at the jail, ending, and then took her into the jail for uh, tox -wiser. Do you remember any dialogue um, between the, the roadside and, and the detention center? I do not. I do not, sir. Fair enough. Did, um, was there any discussion about um, the, the Tahoe, the ownership of the Tahoe? I remember something briefly about she had just graduated, possibly, and that was a present. Um, she's not the registered owner of it. When I ran the registration, she'd come back as a registered owner. But I think, believe she said it was a it was a present for uh, her graduating. And where did uh, where did you transport her? Shelby County Detention. And just tell the jury um, what what happens once you pull into the detention center. I uh, pull into detention center, call out my miles, uh, advise the detention center that I have one female at the main gate for them to let me in, so they know to send a female deputy or male, depending on who it is. You know what sex of person you have to search them uh, with this particular instance I brought her into jail uh, immediately we go to the left in the jail where the intoxilizer room is and uh, the intoxilizer to bring it out of standby mode there's a big green button on the front push that to bring the intoxilizer out of standby mode and I take an intoxilizer slip on the bottom of the slip you write observation began at and you wait for the intoxilizer to produce a time Okay, let me ask you just a couple of preliminary questions before we jump into the intoxilizer. Um, did you administer any additional tests at the detention center, such as the field sobriety test? Do you redo the field sobriety testing at the detention center? I don't know. Okay. And you, you made reference to an intoxilizer slip or card. I'm not sure what word you uh, You could call it either. Uh, it's, it's a three-page... Uh, three page you could say it's a card um, three pages and it when it when the intoxilizer prints on it it prints through the same thing to all three pages do you have uh, one of the three original copies uh, on your person today yes I do okay may I see that yes I have it on the, my on the table over here underneath my hat That's the bottom of the three. And I'm going to mark this as Commonwealth Exhibit 1, if I may. Thank you. No objection, Judge. So entered.
identification purposes only at this point. I'm going to mark this as Commonwealth Exhibit 2. No objection. So admitted. Have you, by chance, brought a copy of an intoxilizer certification? I did. Okay. Do you have that on your person? Uh, that is also. Uh, I believe this is a copy of it. I didn't see the original. Um, the original should be in the same spot as this intoxilizer card. That's it. It's, you know, yeah, I've got to do, I've got to do, uh, it should be expiring in October. So well, I've got to redo so I mean, uh, you can have it. I'll hold on. I'll use this okay. as my copy. Um, For purposes of today's trial, Your Honor, I have no objection if the Commonwealth wants to admit a copy of the original. That Thank you. Okay. Probably gone in reverse order here, but you mentioned the intoxilizer print card first, so I want it for identification purposes as Commonwealth Exhibit One. But I'm probably going to talk about that last. Um, if you don't mind, please take a look at Commonwealth Exhibit Three and familiarize yourself with that. Can you tell me what that is? That is a uh, certification to operate the. Uh, Toxilizer 5000 EN through Department of Criminal Justice Training. Okay, what is the date of that certification? Looks like uh, October 24th of 2014. All right, and, and I'd ask that that be admitted now as Commonwealth's uh, Exhibit Number Three. Objection. Objection. So admitted. Can you tell me what that is? It's what's it for? Uh, this is just to show that I have recertified the intoxilizer training that we receive. The 40-hour training uh, expires. So every two years, and prior to that second year, you need to recertify with a class. Uh, it can be done online, or you can go in person. Was a class to say to refresh you in the operation of the intoxilizer. Okay. And once you successfully pass a written test on that, and you actually have to go to a detention center and run a breathalyzer card um, for yourself. So you blow into it and everything, and then keep that card for your records. After you transported the defendant to the detention center, did you attempt to obtain a, a sample of her breath? in order to determine the concentration of alcohol in her breath. Before um, you asked her to submit a sample of her breath, did, did you read an implied consent warning notice to her? Yes, sir. And can you, do you have a copy of the implied consent warnings that you would have um, notified her of on March 15th of 2015? Yes, sir. And. If you don't mind, please familiarize yourself with uh, Commonwealth's Exhibit Number Two. It's one page. Can you tell me what that is? 
Uh, this is an instruction sheet from Department of Criminal Justice Training. Um, it's, uh, it's got the, uh, at the time, the, the, it's since changed, but it's got at the time the implied consent warning. Okay. And did you read this ex these exact implied consent warnings to uh, Ms. Wood? Yeah. Yes, sir. And did you read it word for word? Did. Did she read the form herself or did you read it? I read it. And would you read it to the jury, please, word for word? I will be requesting that you submit to a test of your breath, blood, or urine, or any combination of these tests. If you refuse to submit to any test which I request, your refusal may be used against you in court as evidence of your violation of KRS 21A-010, and your driver's license will be revoked. If you are convicted of KRS 21A-010, your refusal will subject you to a mandatory minimum jail sentence, which is twice as long as the mandatory minimum jail sentence. That would be imposed if you submit to all requested test. You will also be unable to obtain a hardship license. The results of any test taken may be used against you in court as evidence of your violation of KRS 29A010. If the results are .15 or above and you are convicted of violating KRS 29A010, you will be subject to a jail sentence that is twice as long as the mandatory minimum jail sentence. That will be imposed if the results are less than .15. If you submit to all tests which I request, you have the right to obtain a test or tests of your blood performed at your expense by a qualified person of your choosing within a reasonable amount of time of your arrest. Now, I want you to repeat that last sentence or paragraph, please. If you submit to all tests which I request, you have the right to obtain a test or tests of your blood performed at your expense by a qualified person of your choosing within a reasonable time of your arrest. Okay. And I would ask that this be admitted as be admitted as Commonwealth's Exhibit 2, please. No objections. So admitted. All right. Now, um, you mentioned an observation. What, what is an observation period? Uh, the observation period is designed for uh, to get the residual mouth alcohol out of somebody's mouth. And based on training, it takes about 20 minutes to do that. The, uh, it, the, the intoxilizer will read differently if you take a drink of an alcoholic beverage right now and blow versus wait 20 minutes and blow because it's gathering the molecules from your mouth versus the molecules from your lungs. And did you, um, did you have an observation period for Ms. Wood before you asked her to submit? Yes, sir. What time did that observation period commence? At uh, 2.16 in the morning. And how do you know that? Because as soon as we walked into the jail, that's the first thing I do is write observation began, bring the machine out of standby, and I write observation began at the time. That's your own handwriting? Yes, sir. All right. And do you, um, can you tell if that's a, a true and accurate copy of the intoxilizer print card that was generated by the intoxilizer 5000 EN at the detention center after Miss Wood? Um, submitted a breath sample. It is. And, and how, how can you confirm that? Uh, I keep all of the originals of the intoxilizers from the certification on the 8,000 now to the 5,000s. I keep every single original. Um, the top two copies go to the courts and I keep these for my records. Okay. Well, we know that you keep them, but how can you tell that that is the, the um, test card printed in association with Miss Wood's sample? I mean, I, I know it is. I mean, you've got the you can see where the other two pages were off. It's got my own handwriting on it. It's got her name, um, my name, her license number, the date, the time. Fair enough. Um, I, I'd ask to admit that as Commonwealth's Exhibit Number One, I believe. No objection. Um, now, did you offer Miss Wood an opportunity to contact an attorney? I did. Right. Was that part of the implied consent warnings? Yes. Did she elect to contact an attorney? I don't recall. I don't recall if she did or not. Fair enough. Um, how did you intend to obtain a sample of uh, Miss Wood's breath? By utilizing the intoxilizer 5000 in. Please explain uh, what the intoxilizer 5000 instrument is and generally how it works. Uh, it's a uh, it's an it's an instrument that is. Um, made by CMI 
and it is solely designed to look for al alcohol molecules and measure those. Uh, it's as simple as we can put it. Can you tell the jury what serial number um, was uh, of instrument was used that evening? Uh, six eight dash zero one one two nine nine. Were there multiple intoxilizers at the detention center? No. Who maintains and certifies uh, the performance and accuracy of that instrument, if anyone? Our state police lab techs, uh, our uh, Chapter 18 employees, that um, non-sworn employees that work at the lab. And again, I think we've covered this, but on March 15, 2015, were you certified to administer the Intoxilizer 5000 5, uh, test? Yes, sir. Do you have any knowledge regarding whether this intoxilizer uh, was functioning properly um, at that time? It was, yes, sir. And how do you know that? Uh, based on visual clues. I mean, the intoxilizer for first will tell you if it's not. Um, the, the mouth tube that they blow into has to be warm to the touch. It was warm to the touch. Uh, the external alcohol simulator has a little paddle wheel in it. The paddle wheel is moving. Tubes on the back are warm to the touch. Uh, it's not. It's not indicating to me that it's having any issues. Did you observe the defendant for at least 20 minutes before you asked her to provide a sample of her breath? I did. During that period, did she have anything to eat, drink, or smoke? No. Did she ingest anything through her nose during that period? No. Did she belch, regurgitate, or vomit during that period? No. Is there, a pres is there a sequence that the intoxilizer uh, automatically goes through before it generates a, an anal a, a report or an analysis? There is. Um, we abbreviate it as a CABA. So it, it, it has a chamber that it reads the sample through. So it will clean the chamber out as an air blank. And then it will use its own external simulator to pull alcohol into the chamber. It reads that to make sure that it's self-check with intolerance. It clears the tube again, then asks for the subjects or your, your defendant's breath sample. It gives you a reading on that, and then it clears the tube again. So it's, by the time you're done, it will have cleared the tube three times. Okay, and do you know if the intoxilizer followed this automated sequence uh, in this instance? I do. H how do um, you know that? On the card, it reads um, air blank, calibration check, air blank, subject test, air blank. And so the first air blank, it read triple zeros. The calibration. What does, that, what does that mean? Triple zero. It's not reading any alcohol molecules within the chamber. Uh, the calibration check is 0 .077. Um, in order for, based on our training, uh, it needs to be within 0 .005 above an 08 or below an 08. So you have an 075 or an 085, it needs to be in between. In this particular instance, it's 077, so it's within tolerance. Another air blank, three zeros, and then her breath sample, 0 .100. And, and then- I'm sorry, go ahead. And then another air blank to clear out her sample. Okay, now at what time did the instrument test itself with the, the simulator solution? Uh, 0237 in the morning. And at what time did she submit a breast sample and it test her breast sample? 0237 in the morning. So the, within the same minute, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So my understanding is that within the same minute, did you say 237? 237. It started at the air blank at 236 and then it ended the last air blank at 237. So um, it all happened within a minute, yes, sir. Okay, and you mentioned the result was a point, her, her result was a point what? One zero zero. Uh, of what? What are the, the units of, of measurement there? Uh, per 210 milliliters of breath is what it uses. Um, so it's point one zero zero is what it's reading.
And do you know when the syntaxalizer card was created in relation to the test? I mean, does that come out the next day? Is you pick no. that up somewhere else? No, this is this is something that uh, a card that I write the observation began on. I write my name, her name, and once it's time for the test, once the 20 minutes has elapsed, you push the same green button to pull it out of standby mode. There's only one button on the front of it. You push the same button to bring it out of standby mode. Well, this time when you push this button, it feed, you feed this card from the top into the machine, face up into the machine. It grabs the card, sucks the card in, and holds it. I have to manually enter all the information on this. Her name, my name twice for the operator and the arresting officer. Uh, my agency, my ORI, which is the agency I'm with. Um, the citation number, a report number if you have one. Her driver's license number, uh, her date of birth whether she's her race, her sex, and then her ethnic origin. I have to enter all of that. Now, do you share this result with um, the defendant typically? Yes. Um, do you always share the result with the defendant? Yeah. All right, and, and would you have done that in this instance? I did. And, and how do you make the defendant an, aware of the test result? It displays the test result. So the screen that it will display it on is on the left of the instrument. So she would, in the, in the tube that she would have been blowing into is also on the left. So as she's blowing into it, she can see the screen, and it will display. Once she fills the chamber up, it will display the reading of .100. And I will point to it and say, this is what you blew, a .100. It'll print the card off, and I'll point to the card, this is what you blew, a .100. And then after you complete that test and the card's printed, what do you do? Uh, I resort back to the implied consent. Why? Um, uh, you have because there's there's more to it. Okay, there's please tell the jurors it. what it says. Uh, after after she uh, successfully submits to my requested tests. Um, I ask her uh, based upon the information which was previously read to you. Uh, right here. Since you have submitted to all requested tests, you now have the right to have a test or tests of your blood performed at your own expense by a physician, registered nurse, phlebotomist, medical technician, or medical technologist of your choosing within a reasonable amount of time of your arrest. Do you want such a test? And did she um, accept your offer no. to obtain an independent test? No. And you're positive that you would have read that that final portion of the implied consent yes sir it's yeah I would have. do you remember anything else about your interaction uh, with the defendant after the the test was completed uh, I do not I do not besides her being extremely upset that's uh, as far as any interaction with her I don't no, sir. and what was um, what if you remember what was your state of mind when you saw the test result uh, I wasn't surprised I mean, based on based on my training experience and what I saw in my field sobriety test, um, it it coincided. That's all the questions I have this time. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I believe all three of those exhibits were admitted, were they not? Yes, they were. Uh, Mr. Foreman.
Afternoon. Sure. Trooper, you have stated that you have had quite extensive field sobriety test experience, it sounds like. Is that right? You've had experience in a, based on your uh, DOCJT, the Department of Criminal Justice Training background, I see that you've completed your uh, basic training back in April of 08. Does that sound right? Yes. And you have completed LEAP, the Law Enforcement Accelerator Program for KSB, in July 2012. Is that accurate? And you've stated back in 08 you have completed field sobriety test training and intoxilizer training, 40 hours each. But in 2012, it was strictly field sobriety tests, 40 hours worth. Um, in 2012 for state police, it was about half a week of refresher for field sobriety. Half a week of refresher. Yes. So it wasn't the full 40? It wasn't a full. They were, they're not trying to certify you. They're just making sure everyone's on the same page. And then we did a practical on the field sobriety. But there was no retraining on the intoxilizer? And you mentioned you also completed um, a ride, the Advanced Roadside Impairment uh, Program. Yes, sir. That was after March 2015, right? Uh, I've taken it twice. I've had it twice. When was the first time you took it? In the academy with state police. And the second time? I believe it was. March of this year. March of this year? I believe so. So after yes. you've encountered Ms. Wood? Yes. Okay. So again, it, it sounds to me like you're quite familiar with field sobriety tests and you, you've administered, you've, I think you already stated, several hundreds of them. So you know how to perform them. You know how to grade them. No questions asked. Okay. When you, let's, um, let's talk about the stop, okay? When you pulled over Ms. Wood and you have stated that you pulled her over for speeding, Correct. right? In your extensive field sobriety test training, they described to you a series of traffic infractions that are more or less likely to be related to a DUI arrest. Yes. There are about 24 of them, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm, I'd have to ref refresh, but that sounds about right. And some of them are uh, weaving. Uh, swerving, yes, making jerking motions with the vehicle, um, changing lanes unexpectedly without showing a turn signal, yes, not signaling. Could be. None of which you've seen here. No. And speeding is not one of those 24 clues either, is it? No. After you stop Ms. Wood, you've stated that you smelled alcohol coming from the vehicle. Am I correct? An odor of an alcoholic beverage, yes, sir. Odor of an alcoholic beverage coming from the vehicle. Yes. Not from her person. Correct. 
You've also stated that you saw bloodshot, watery eyes. And she made the statement that she was drinking. Correct. But you don't recall if she said how much or what she was drinking? No, sir. No, okay. She did tell you she was coming from Barstone Road. Correct. And she was on her way home to Lexington. Yes. Okay. Now, the three clues that we just discussed, you're also trained, and I don't know how many, uh, I've gone through the, the DUI manual myself many, many times. I, I always lose count of how many clues you actually look for. Uh, you mentioned several of them. I just want to briefly go through. Um, you, did not, you, you stated yourself, I believe, on direct examination, when you asked for her license and registration, she did not fumble with her license. Otherwise, you would write that in the citation, right? Correct. She, um, she was not sweaty. No. She didn't have dry mouth. No. Slurred speech. No. She, when you asked her out of the vehicle, she didn't have any trouble exiting the vehicle. No. She didn't lean on the door. No. She did not leave the vehicle in gear for it to start rolling. She did not climb out of the vehicle. No. She did not lean on the vehicle when you were talking to her. No. She was standing up straight. Yeah. Not swaying. Not that I observed. No. She did not keep her hands on the vehicle for balance. No. She did not have any difficulty exiting the vehicle. No. Um, and I believe I asked that. I apologize. She did not have slurred speech, right? a clear indication of intoxication. Another one is um, glassy eyes, I believe you look for, right? Correct. And her eyes were not glassy. She had bloodshot eyes, but they weren't glassy. The stop occurred at 1.30 in the morning, I believe, correct? Uh, 1.27 is what we have written for the citation, violation time. 1 o'clock in the morning, 1.27. Um, do people normally feel tired around that time? Eh, it depends on the people. You have people working all different kinds of shifts. Some are tired coming from work. Some are awake going to work. So, I mean, that could be looked at multiple different ways. Could red eyes indicate the individual is simply tired? Yeah. Thank you. Her face was not red or flushed, and she was not slow to respond to any of your questions. Did you have to repeat any questions to her that she did not understand she had to re-ask? Not that I recall. You also mentioned one, um, she did not have any trouble walking, which is another very, very strong indicator of intoxication for individuals. Is that right? Right. She didn't have any trouble with it. No. Okay. I'd like to talk about the field sobriety tests that you have conducted in this case. put it in that entryway right as you come in through the bar. That way that I think everybody would be
Can you see this? It's got a little glare, but we can, we can, we're good. Take your word for what it says. I don't know. I can't read it. You've conducted one of the tests that you did was the. Um, excuse me. Let's talk about the HGN first. That was the first test that you did, right? Yeah. Uh, the horizontal gaze nystagmus. In the academy, I don't know if they teach it at the KSB. I know that they teach it at the uh, the first academy that you went to in 08. They tell you that nystagmus occurs is a naturally, both naturally and a chemically occurring um, phenomenon in the eye. Something to do with the fluid in the eye, I believe. Is that right? They explained it to us as it's the uncontrolled twitching of the eye. Uncontrolled twitching. What does that mean? It means you don't have control over it. Okay. And it's caused, uh, one of the causes, excuse me, is alcohol. Correct. Uh, and they also teach you that there are about 60 other causes such as tobacco, caffeine. Um, some people have naturally occurring nystagmus, maybe not resting, but some do. it happens. And you were also taught that excessive tiredness can also lead to nystagmus. Mm, do you I recall that? I remember that one. No? OK. That's fine. And you were also trained that after performing the horizontal gaze and the stagmus, you will estimate in about, I think the figure they have in the book is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is 77% of cases that you see four clues on, that will be an accurate indicator of impairment. Does that yes. sound right? So in 23 out of 100 cases, you can see four clues and you're wrong. Correct. Let's talk about the walk and turn. I've outlined here, I believe there are, and you mentioned this yourself, there are eight clues. There's the balancing during instructions, starting too soon, stopping while walking, touching heel to toe, stepping off the line, using arms for balance, doing an improper turn, and having the wrong number of steps. Did I miss anything? That's it. In your citation, you wrote that on the walk and turn, the subject turned improperly. Is Correct. that right? Turn improperly. Here we go. We'll give her a zero. She failed that, right? Showed a clue. Yes, Showed a clue. Oh, excuse me. Showed a clue. Then she stepped off the line on counts five and eight on her return steps. Where do we have that? So she got nine steps fine one way, but then she got only seven right coming the other way. Correct. The last thing you put on here is she used her arms for balance. Yes. Right? The entire time? She like this? Yes. The entire time. Okay. So 
everything else she did correctly, according to your citation and your observations that night. Correct. Didn't do well on that one. Seventy-seven percent. What is that? A C plus? I guess a C plus. Assuming she was walking like that the whole time, right? Correct. That's what you observed. Correct. Okay. Next. You administered the one leg stand, right? Correct. Now, on that, you're looking for, I know for certain you're looking for four clues. I added on here, and feel free to uh, tell me if this is not a clue that you're looking for, but I believe the individual has to count out loud while they're holding their foot up in the air, right? It's not a clue. It's not a clue. It's not. So if they're starting to count one, three, 72, that's not a clue. Per training, it's not a clue. It's a clue for showing a possible influence, but it's not a clue we were trained to look for. But it's something that you would look for, yes. right? Following officers' instructions, swaying, using arms for balance, not hopping, and keeping the foot off the ground. Yes. Those are the things you're looking for. Those four. And the only thing that you mentioned was that she used her arms for balance. Everything else flawless. Correct. The whole time? Yes. Much better on this one, didn't she? Looks, appears to be. B. And pursuant to your training and, and uh, the DOCJT department that issued you the, your um, certificate, you were trained in the FSDs that one clue is not enough to successfully, excuse me, one clue is not enough to consider that a failed attempt. 
Correct. at a test. Correct. So even still, despite my board, by your training even, she passed this test. That one? Yes. And let me just also back up for a second. Um, going back to the percentages, we talked about the fact that the HGN will be wrong 23% of the time. Um, on the walk and turn, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's 68% of the time will be correct. So it will not be accurate in 32 out of 100 cases, give or take. And with the one leg stand, it's even lower by 3%, about 35. About two thirds will be accurate. It will be an accurate assessment. Do you, do you remember from your training? No, oh, it's been a while. Was the, the, the statistics on that, sir, stats. But do you remember talking about them in your training? Yes, sir. Yeah. OK. You said that you are certified to operate the intoxilizer. When you were in training on the intoxilizer, did you all discuss something called the partition ratio? I don't recall that. You don't remember anything no, about sir. that? section of KRS 189A.010 is right at the beginning of the statute. It specifically um, defines the alcohol concentration under uh, breath or by blood. Kentucky law does not require any conversion of the breath alcohol rating to a blood alcohol concentration. That's what the partition ratio deals with. The partition ratio, it comes from Henry's law. Henry's law says that there's always a ratio between the blood and the air outside of the blood when there is a, uh, not a toxic substance, but a, a substance that's dissolved that is, uh, let me see what word I'm looking for. Okay. a volatile substance in the blood. Henry's law says that there is a proportion between the alcohol concentration or volatile substance in the blood and the air outside the blood. But Kentucky law doesn't force us to convert a breath alcohol reading to guess indirectly what the blood alcohol concentration is. So under Kentucky law, Kentucky amended their statute to define breath alcohol concentration and say that you can be convicted just solely by the fact that your breath alcohol concentration is greater than 0.08 uh, grams per 210 milliliters, or excuse me, liters of breath. And it also defines it as 0.08 or greater per milliliter of blood. So there's no need for partition testimony under Kentucky law or partition evidence. We're not arguing that her blood concentration was in violation of Kentucky law. We're solely arguing that her breath alcohol concentration was in violation of Kentucky law. John is absolutely correct. There, the fact that the uh, if you're going to try and convert yourself the breath alcohol concentration to blood alcohol concentration that would be a, in violation, in direct violation of the statute. The one thing that Ms. Robinson failed to mention is that the machine does that automatically. The machine does not spit out a BRAC. The machine does it all on its own. You don't need to convert it mathematically in your head or have a scientist. Otherwise, 
expert testimony would have been required by the Commonwealth in every DUI trial to show that um, unless the Commonwealth, uh, excuse me, unless the legislature simply uh, allowed the use of breath alcohol concentration. Which it does, Judge, if you would just look under the definition section. But the machine doesn't even spit out the breath alcohol concentration. It's, it converts That's not true. it. That's not true. Uh, the machine and so measures the. I, I didn't hear an objection. I heard a may we approach, yes. but I'm assuming that there's. So I'd object, yes, to any questions about uh, the partition and, ratio. And, and he already answered that it doesn't know, so. Uh, I, I will grant uh, uh, Mr. Robinson's objection. I don't think, uh, based on my interpretation of uh, 189A or 101 subsection A, that we have to do a conversion. It's one or the other, it's a breath or blow. So. Uh, so Thank you. Trooper, back when we discussed the, all the things that Ms. Wood did right on the side of the road, do you remember? Yes, sir. Once again, the only things that you saw that she did incorrectly were the improper turn, stepping off the line and counts five and eight, using arms for balance on the walk and turn. Yes? Yes, sir. And on the one leg stand, using arms for balance, yes, sir. including uh, four clues on the HGN. Correct. And all of the things that I asked you about that you did not see are also indicators of her being a sober person. Could be. No further questions. Any follow-up questions for this witness? Briefly, Judge. Yeah. Trooper, um, is this how you score field sobriety testing? No. Okay. Um, on the HGN test, how many clues is it that you look for? Six. Is that how many you've been trained to look for? Yes. How many clues did you observe um, when you administered the test on Miss Wood? Four. Okay. So if you get two out of six right, would that be a, a passing grade? No. We're looking for um, what would not be a passing grade would be four. So in that, this particular instance, you're looking for four. four okay. Clues. And on the, the walk and turn test, how many particular clues are you looking for? Eight. You're not looking for, hold on, where was the other board? On the walk and turn test, how many clues are you looking for? Eight. Um, is it fair to say that you're not looking for 93 no. clues? No. Okay. Have you ever utilized this? No, sir. Besides, I mean, besides what it's saying the exercise performed, that's correct. These um, are the clues. This is what you look for. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, were you trained to score this way? at the DOCJT? No, sir, I've never seen that before. Were you trained to score this way at the K KSP Academy? No, sir. Right. Trooper, um, you've probably had a, a couple of cases in your career that, that you remember because someone was particularly under the influence. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. Sometimes people are so under the influence that you don't even administer the field sobriety test. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Okay. Have you ever administered a test where someone would have failed all 93 steps on the walk and turn? No. Um, have you administered tests? How many, t excuse me, how many clues were you looking for again on the walk and turn? Walk and turn eight. Okay. Have you ever had someone fail all or 
manifest all eight clues on the walk and turn? Yes. Okay. Would that person have um, failed all 93 steps that Mr. Foreman has brought up? If you'd like to look in, at it again. In that, in that model, yes. Okay. So you've had people that haven't been able to make a single step, right? Correct. So on this, um, if she had manifested four out of eight clues on the walk and turn, is that the number that you observed? Uh, on this particular um, uh we've got uh, three. Three out of eight? Three out of eight. Okay. And let me grab my calculator. So does that mean that she didn't manifest five out of the eight clues? Correct. And by my calculations, five divided by eight is 62, 62%. 62 so she would have passed 62% of the clues based on the way you've been trained to score this test. Correct. And she would have failed 38% of the yes. test as it's, you've been trained to um, administer it. Correct. Right. And as to the HGN, one more time, how many of those clues did she pass out of six? Uh, I saw four four of the six. So she would have passed successfully not shown two of the six clues that you were looking for, correct? correct. And that's one third, correct? correct? So does, does that mean that she did not manifest 33% of the clues that you were looking for? Yes. And she did manifest 66% of the clues that you were looking for? Yes. Right. No further questions. Any uh, follow-up, Mr. Foreman? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, is that all for this witness? It is, Judge. Okay. Thank you, Trooper Miller. We need these exhibits back. Um, can I have the attorney's approach real quick, please? 